when it comes to attempting to understand the psychology behind someone who commits heinous acts of violence, it's often very hard for many of us to do. To most of us, the act of committing murder is generally a bizarre and unexplainable event, but there are some cases out there that are truly incomprehensible, even to the experts. Motiveless and with a lack of clues, today's cases involve seemingly ordinary people who were brutally executed in peculiar circumstances, leaving authorities and online sleuths alike empty-handed but for their wildest theories. Jonathan Luna Born October 21st, 1965, Jonathan Paul Luna was a married father of two who'd grown up in the South Bronx in New York City. After studying at the University of North Carolina School of Law, he went on to several high-profile jobs before eventually securing a place as an assistant US attorney in Baltimore. On the evening of December 4th, 2003, Jonathan had been pulling a late shift at the Baltimore courthouse as he prepared for a case the following morning that involved him prosecuting two defendants in a drug conspiracy trial. He phoned a co-worker around 9 p.m., letting them know he'd be leaving soon to go and continue with his work at home. He had also called the defense attorney earlier that night, telling him he'd fax over documents, but he never did. Despite telling his colleague he was leaving soon, Jonathan didn't actually exit the building until 11.38 p.m. Oddly, he had left his glasses, which he needed to drive, and his mobile phone on his desk. He drove northeast on the I-95 and passed several toll booths, three to be precise. He used his easy pass to get through them, however, after this, he switched to purchasing toll tickets. At 12.57 a.m., $200 was withdrawn from Jonathan's bank account from an ATM machine at JFK Plaza Service Center near Newark, Delaware. After this, Jonathan's electronic fingerprint shows him at 2.47 a.m. as he crossed the Delaware River Toll Bridge, and about half an hour later, activity on his debit card showed that he purchased gas at the King of Prussia Service Plaza. The last journey that Jonathan made was at 4.04 a.m., when his car exited the turnpike at the Reading-Lancaster Interchange. A spot of blood was noticed on his toll booth ticket, and it was speculated that the 38-year-old had already been injured. At 5.30 a.m., Jonathan's car was found parked at 1439 Dry Tavern Road in Denver, Pennsylvania. A passerby noticed the car with its lights off, and its front end in a creek. Blood was smeared on the driver's door and on the left section of the car, whilst Jonathan was face down in the stream under the car engine. He still wore his suit and black overcoat, and his court ID was hanging around his neck. As authorities were called in and the gruesome scene of the death was investigated, more troubling information was found. There was a pool of blood in the car on the rear seat floor, and it was found that Jonathan Luna had been stabbed 36 times with his own pocket knife, with the wounds concentrated around his neck and chest. He had also incurred a head injury, although his final cause of death was ruled by several coroners as homicide by drowning. Despite the words of several experienced coroners, the FBI, who also looked into the case, determined that Jonathan had died by suicide. And, strangely, they pushed for the medical examiners and the Lancaster County authorities to concur with this statement. The FBI argued that the wounds on Jonathan's hands were shallow and looked like hesitation wounds that one would find on the body of a suicide victim. They claimed he did not have substantial defense wounds. They suggest a motive for taking his own life centered around the fact that $36,000 had gone missing from a bank robbery case he had prosecuted, and that Jonathan was going to be facing a polygraph test in relation to this. They also said it was possible he had attempted to stage an abduction and attack to excuse him from inquiries or perhaps garner sympathy 
from investigators. However, local authorities and coroners dismissed these attempts at smearing Jonathan's name. One of the coroners in the case said that Jonathan's hands had been shredded by self-defense wounds, and any shallow wounds he'd received were likened to torture. Jonathan's throat had been slashed, and he had sustained wounds on his back. The blood in the back seat of the car suggested to police that he had been in the rear while somebody else was driving the vehicle. A second blood type was found in the car, as well as partial prints which did not belong to Jonathan. These have both yet to be linked to anyone, as suspects and motives in the case remain hard to determine. Grainy CCTV footage from near the time of the gas station purchase made with Jonathan's credit card was recovered, but doesn't seem to have provided any new leads. He was not seen on the camera, but several workers came forward to claim that they had seen him that night, and he had appeared calm. The $200 that had been withdrawn littered his car in bills. Rumours swirled as the peculiar case of Jonathan Luna hit the headlines many of which disparaged the lawyer's reputation. Whispers began that he had a poor relationship with his boss and was on the verge of being fired, while another US attorney clarified that Jonathan's job was not at risk. There also appeared to be no solid evidence to corroborate the claims that he was involved in the missing $36,000. One odd detail that emerged was that Jonathan's name had been used on either a dating website or to solicit sex from prostitutes, but there isn't any evidence to support whether Jonathan himself did such a thing or if someone simply used the name. The 38-year-old had also racked up $25,000 in debts, 17,000 worth of which was on credit cards that his wife alleged she did not know about. There is currently a reward offered of $100,000 for any information leading to a conviction in this case. But as of 2020, the case of Jonathan Luna is still open and unsolved. Morris Davis Jr. In Great Falls, Montana, on April 5th, 1985, at around 11 p.m., paramedics were called to the scene of a multiple shooting inside of a home. Upon entering, one of the paramedics, Cliff Davies, found his 23-year-old brother. Morris Vernon Davies Jr. had been shot more than eight times and was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. It appeared that the motive for murder had been robbery, as the killer had taken Morris's delivery wallet and nothing else. The wallet contained less than $300. Four months before the murder, Morris had taken up a part-time pizza delivery driver job. He was the next available driver the night he was killed, meaning that it was unlikely he had been specifically targeted. The telephone order was made to Howard's Pizza at 8.43 p.m., and at 9.15 p.m., Morris left with the food. When he did not return back to his place of work, another driver was sent to check on him, discovering the grim murder scene. Police found that the local home was actually vacant and that the for sale sign at the front of the house had been removed. The back door had been forced open, allowing the killer access to the building. Since there was no phone service in the house, it was likely that the call made to place the order for pizza was done so from a nearby payphone. Authorities theorized that Morris had been killed upon entering the house, but no suspects could be determined until three years later. On May the 11th, 1988, in a town 180 miles from Great Falls, a man was arrested for driving a car stolen from Oregon three days prior. When the unidentified thief was searched, it was found that he had two receipts from a pawn shop with one being a 22 caliber pistol, the same caliber that murdered Morris Davis Jr. three years earlier. After locating the weapon at the pawn shop, authorities discovered that the pistol had also been reported stolen three days earlier. Extensive ballistic testing carried out on the gun 
showed that it was the murder weapon in the case of the pizza delivery driver in 1985. According to the unidentified man who had possession of the gun, he'd stolen it from a friend several days prior to his arrest, and he denied any involvement in the murder of Morris Davis Jr. Not only this, but the real owner of the gun, who went by Rick in articles of the time, also claimed he knew nothing about the murder, and that he had an alibi in the form of him being at home on the night of the crime, looking after his son. He told police that only he and his wife knew where the gun was kept, and investigators struggled to understand how someone could possibly know where the gun was, take it, and then return it without its owners being any the wiser. Upon investigating the alibi and the background of Rick, police deemed him not a suspect in the 1985 murder. The only other lead in the case comes from Morris's brother, Cliff, one of the paramedics who was called into the scene of the shooting. Cliff initially believed that Rick knew who was responsible, but in October of 1995, more advanced ballistic testing was carried out on the pistol, and it was determined that it was not the murder weapon after all. Cliff then came to believe that the prime suspect in the murder of his brother was a man called Donald Debray. Debray had been convicted of the 1986 murder of a convenience store clerk who was working the night shift, Suzanne Pritchard. She had been shot 24 times and robbed of $300. Like the murder of Morris, the act seemed to be violent and excessive, especially for a fairly small amount of cash. Cliff contacted Debray several times about the murder of his brother. He alleged that Debray had a very specific knowledge about the house where the crime took place, where shots were fired from, and where the body was found, amongst other things. Debray reportedly claimed that he was in the house at the time of the murder, but did not pull the trigger. After this information came to light, police made Debray a prime suspect in the case, but he died in prison in 2016, and never confessed to the murder of Morris, despite detectives' attempts to try and gain closure for the Davis family. As of 2020, the murder of Morris Davis Jr. remains unsolved. Rose Burkett and Roger Atkinson On September 12, 1980, Rose Burkett, a 22-year-old single mother working as a trainee nurse, and Roger Atkinson, a 32-year-old telephone installer repairman, attempted to check into a Amarna Holiday Inn near Williamsburg, Iowa. Due to a convention that was on, there were no vacancies available, and they were turned away. A cancellation came up later in the day, and the pair were fortunate enough to be able to book the room. Nothing appeared to be out of the ordinary with the couple. They did not make a fuss or draw attention to themselves during their stay. However, at noon the next day, when the housekeeping was doing their rounds, something seemed amiss. The pair did not respond to knocks on the door or requests for the maid to be allowed inside. Suspicious, the maid let herself in with the master key and saw the feet of the couple on the bed. Assuming they were asleep, she peered in further, only to be met with a bloodbath of a crime scene. Both Rose and Roger were dead on the bed of their hotel room. They had sustained fatal head injuries, and Roger's fingers were severed from trying to defend himself from the attack. The huge blood loss and brain trauma endured by both parties were labelled as the cause of their death, with authorities determining that the wounds were made with either an axe or a hatchet. Rose was fully dressed, whilst Roger wore only shorts. The TV was still on in the room, and, oddly, two chairs had been pulled up next to the bed, leading authorities to wonder if the couple had some kind of conversation with the killer. This coupled with the fact that there was no sign of forced entry, brought about the speculation that the pair knew their murderer. Further evidence in the room showed that the killer had put his feet upon the desk and carved a bar of soap, using it to write this on a bathroom mirror, a strange clue that has brought no new leads to the case. Over 400 people were interviewed by authorities, including staff and guests at the inn. 
However, it seems more likely that someone closer to home was involved. A likely suspect in the case was Rose's ex-boyfriend, whom she had kicked out of her home for his drug use. She'd recently taken out a personal protection order against this unidentified man and bought a dog for protection. One day when she returned home from work though, she found her dog had been brutally slaughtered and hung up in her front yard. Investigators did look into Rose's ex-boyfriend but found that his alibi checked out. He also seemed to pass a polygraph test, although this is known to not be foolproof as a method of proving someone's innocence. Another suspect in the double murder was Roger's uncle, Charles Ray Hatcher, who was a serial killer. He had escaped from a mental facility in September of 1980, but was later apprehended again. However, he was never questioned about the crime concerning his nephew. According to an article in the local paper in September 1980, agents from Missouri and Illinois were brought in to assist with investigating the case and they were looking into a similar murder committed less than three months prior, on June 25th, where a hatchet was used in the crime. Unfortunately, Roger's father died in 2004 and his mother followed him eight years later. Neither found justice for their son. One of Rose's closest friends, Tammy Berkman, works to keep the case alive even though it cost her her own marriage. As of 2020, the case of Rose and Roger remains unsolved. And there you have the facts. Three bizarre, unexplained, and unsolved murders. Please leave a comment with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.